Welcome to Sport the Talk Show. My name is Marion Asantifojo, and today we're recording episode four on mental health and societal pressure. With me, I have my wonderful guest. I would like them to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Bella, and I'm a project manager for a mental health service. Welcome, Bella. Hey, my name is Karthik. I work as a research assistant in CNWO NHS. Welcome, guys. Right, so today, this topic really is very close to my heart. And before we go into the main discussion, I just want to know from you, what is mental health to you? Anyone? Um, I can start. Um, well, generally, mental health is um, the absence of mental illness and it really relates to someone's emotional and you know psychological state yeah, yeah. That's a good one. what do you think what is mental health to you in um, for me in terms of mental health um, it means just the general well-being of someone um, just how we have physical health mm. mental health is also a term just how we do things to keep our physical fitness and physical health in good shape. We sh we have practices that should help us in terms of mental health as well. So mental health is not a bad term, it's not a negative term, nor is a positive term. It's just a term that's, um, for me, it's just saying how do you look after your mental mind being, your, your mindset, yeah. Thank you, because I mean, a lot of times when we say mental health, it's like, oh, it's negative, you're mad. Mm -hmm. But we have a physical health which we really love to take care of, like going yeah. to the gym, eat right? But when it comes to the mental health side of stuff, we don't really like to talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Do you think there's any reason why we kind of like push it to the side, mm -hmm. if I'm making sense? Is my question clear? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think with the differences, like with physical, well-being or physical illness is visible yeah. you know you can see it you like, you can tell what well, this person's not walking properly you know there's something wrong with their legs but with mental health because um, it's kind of like um, it's internal you know it's invisible so it's hard for people to see or to actually believe um, how a person's feeling so if I tell you like you know I'm stressed right now and it's hard it will be hard for you to pick up on it do you know what I mean? Because it's not visible unless, you know, I'm feeling tired, sleeping, that you might believe in it. So the difference is like with mental health, um, it's not visible. So it's, it's really hard to understand, to grasp what it's all about. Whereas like physical is, you know, out there. It's, yeah, in the eye. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add to what Abella's just said? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, she stole the words right out of my mouth. I mean, that's that's what my point of view is. Um, I think what I'll add is, um, as humans, we have a fear of the unknown. Yeah. Um, if you go trace it back through ages in history, uh, when someone had a, a physical disease, say something like uh, the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, people would attribute it to, um, attribute it to, you know, witches, witchcraft, black magic, um, spiritual things because they didn't understand it until we got microscopes and we saw that there were bacteria and we can't really see the causes of uh, mental health illnesses and so i think because we don't know what it is we don't know where it's coming from we we have this fear of the unknown we just can't place what it is there and so therefore there is that stigma around it because of that yeah well thank you so much i mean we're just going to go and list the type of mental illnesses that exist um on my research i've got anger um, I think we all get, I get angry a lot, like, you know, you get angry over little things, sometimes over big things, um, but that could also be, you know, known as a mental illness if you cannot manage it properly. Um, so what I've got down is anger is a natural response um, to feeling attacked or deceived, frustrated or treated unfairly. Do we agree with that? You normally get angry mm. when you feel like, you know, things are not really going your way. Yeah. Yeah. And it says everyone gets angry. Do you get angry? Yeah. Do you? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's part of being human. Yeah. Um, it says it's all. It isn't always a bad emotion. Um, in fact, it's sometimes useful. You know, you, you yeah. can express how you feel if you're not yeah. happy about something. Um, for example, feeling angry about something can help us identify um, problems yeah. or things that are hurting us. Yeah. Um, so, to you, when does anger become an an issue like becomes an illness from the normal being human effect to like actually know you need help I'll take that one actually yeah. um, so we have in our society we have say um, 
an accepted response to a particular um, particular stimulus or particular thing that is happening we have an accepted response now when the accepted response is greater than what we what we expect it to be then there becomes an issue so if we have um, someone taking my glasses for example my expected response will be why are you taking it give it back to me but if my expected response for that was to 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 harm them in a in a very lethal way then that is not an acceptable response to what just happened so for anger if it comes to that point and if it also comes to a point where it cannot be controlled where it cannot be so no one can say um, there's no inhibition where I cannot control myself and I do something very dangerous then that becomes an issue so it's it's the shift from accepted uh, yeah accepted action for what that is happening yeah oh, that's, that's a good one Bella any 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 addition to what um, I think is said about um, I agree with your um, definition and yeah so I think anger becomes an issue when you can't control it. as you said you know it's affecting your everyday life and you can't manage it anymore yeah. so um, you know like you can't do it's like you're reacting all the time to anything so any emotions you're there you're being so reactive rather than you know being able to control yourself so yeah like that's what I wanted to add on that yeah Yes, you guys are right, spot on. Um, so anger only becomes a problem when it harms you or people around you. This can happen when you regularly express anger through unhelpful or distractive behaviour. Your anger is having a negative impact on your overall mental health. So the mental health thing is just your general well-being, so mental and physical health. Um, yeah. So any other types of mental illness? I mean, I've got anxiety and panic attacks. What is that to you? Should I throw that to you, Bella? Yeah, so my understanding of um, anxiety and panic attack. Um, so anxiety is more of um, when you kind of like, when it's a feeling of um, fear or maybe I'm like feeling nervous of what's, what's about to happen or um, what's going to happen in the future. Um, obviously we all feel that way sometimes, you know, when you have exams or you have a driving test coming up, you're feeling anxious. But when you get to a point where you can't really do, you know, the normal things like stepping out because you don't want to face the crowd or, you, you know, um, there's different types of anxiety, you know, um, anxiety disorders. But um, to me, panic attack it's also it could be a symptom or a sign of anxiety you know so when you're feeling nervous I work with a lot of people who when they get really anxious they have panic attack and it's so serious that they can't do anything else you know it really affects their you know their daily lives um, their routines their everything so yeah so anxiety is basically um, fearing of what's about to happen or um, feeling you know nervous about what's about to happen and what can happen in the future really about anxiety and panic attacks? Um, uh, very little, but I'll have yeah. a crack at it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's that response. Again, it's, it's the response where you cannot, um, you cannot do your daily activities. You cannot do what you want, what you planned out to do through the whole day. But it's not just that. It's not just a um, fear of just what's happening or what could happen in the future. It's completely theoretical. Um, because there is no rational well, for for us um, from looking at from outside in there's no rational way of saying this could cause it but for us there is always a could there is always a it might happen getting in a lift the lift might stop it, it's an it's a risk that we're taking but because it's such a small risk we kind of take it outside but what happens is um, when someone struggles with anxiety is that they take that small risk they magnify it it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and it's something that we call uh, catastrophizing it's we do that and we do that yeah. in the sense that we if we are i mean i did it i broke my leg uh, recently and i was at home for two months just by myself because 
you know, wife has to go to work. Someone has to bring the money home. So uh, I was I was at home and uh, I was watching TV. And this there's only s <laughs> yeah, not me. I'm chilling at home. <laughs> but it's only so much. There's only so much Netflix that you can watch. And so I was at home and I was watching Netflix. And then you know thoughts come in. You're like uh, you're like uh, wh where am I gonna get the money from? What's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen here? What's gonna happen to my job? Am I gonna have that security? And I start spiraling. It's it's something that we it's called catastrophizing we take something that's small something that may not even happen but because the risk is there because we are focusing on the risk rather than forgetting the risk we just keep keep building on it keep building on it, it just cycles and for people who have anxiety who struggle with anxiety uh, as an issue it becomes something much more than you know the risk becomes something much more and it affects their daily living yeah <laughs> you yeah, have something to add on that. Yeah, because I actually like what you just said. Like, you know, because um, yeah, we all go through that, yeah. and then it's just the mindset as well. It's it's a cognitive process. Do you know what I mean? Because we're all perceiving um, a situation but differently. Do you know what I mean? So you're thinking, right? I've just lost a job, but you're not actually thinking of the possibility that you might get another job. But you're thinking, like, oh my god, like, if I leave this job, I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose that. Like, you know, it's just and then, yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's a mindset as well. Thanks, guys. Oh, you literally said everything. Um, so anxiety is what we feel when we are worried, as you guys have said, or tense or afraid, um, particularly about things that is about to happen. So like the unforeseen future, um, you're uncertain about what's yeah. about to happen to you. Um, you know. So yeah. So anxiety can become a mental health issue um, if it impacts your ability to live your life fully on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for example, it may be a problem if you're feeling anxious or very strong um, sense that lasts a long time. So it's not like a one-off thing, like you've got a quick presentation, but it's like an ongoing thing, like a daily thing, then that is the cause of, you know, of concern. Right, um, so what is bipolar to you, Bella? Um, so my understanding of bipolar is, um, it relates to someone's mood change. So someone could be feeling um, low today or now, and then in the next hour, they'll be feeling high, and then to the extreme, you know. So um, that's what I understand. And I also know that it's kind of linked to um, a personality disorder, or it might be a personality disorder from my understanding yet. Yeah. Any, any addition to what Bella just said about bipolar? Yeah. Um, so when someone um, has bipolar, yeah. Um, they can go through two phases. One would be the manic phase and the other one would be the depressive phase. When someone's in the depressive phase, they, they would, would not be able to get out of bed. They, they will not find any motivation in their, in their system to be able to get up and do things of their normal life. And so, again, it affects their routine. They can't do what they want to do. Someone in the manic phase is someone who would say yes to everything. You know, when we when we do have normal things, um, when when we want to do something, anyone, the brain goes through a process of saying, "Oh, what's the benefits of it? What's the risks of it? Should I do it?" Yeah. Um, so, say I'm going bungee jumping. What's the benefits of it? Uh, am I uh, the thrill of it? What's the risks of it? The cord could snap, and it could it could lead to my death. Right. But we don't really see that because the risks are still there, but we don't really look at it. Now, with someone who has uh, who's in the manic phase would be able to would, would say yes to most things in life they wouldn't really recognize the risk for the risk itself they would say okay yes 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 and so they are they are a yes person they would do everything I mean this is a very generalization but this is some things I've seen is that those are the risks and um, I mean that's my understanding of bipolar yeah thank you um, so what I have got on my notes is um bipolar disorder is a mental illness <laughs> no doubt that mainly affects your mood um, so you have bipolar disorder you are likely to have manic as you said manic and hypomanic episodes of feeling really high and also depressive episodes like feeling really low um, potentially some um, psychotic symptoms during manic or depressive states you might hear these different types of experiences referred to as mood states and you can read um, you know in so that yeah so 
going on to depression, which I think is a big one that we all know. Uh, I've been depressed before. I don't know about you, but I feel it's it's a natural feeling that you know you go through stages in life where you feel like a bit down, feel a bit you know happy. So, to you, what is depression? What is it? Is it is it healthy to be depressed or is it unhealthy? What what is it? Um, I think depression because um, everyone can feel depressed. Depression is a natural feeling. Like first of all, it's a natural feeling because anyone could feel depressed, but it becomes a mental illness when you can't really um, again cope with it. When it's affecting your daily routine and your daily lives, where you're feeling so low that you can't do the basic things like you know getting out of bed or making um, dinner, or even just like walking down or going to the toilet becomes a struggle just through depression and I think it is one of the most common mental health um, conditions that we're seeing uh, nowadays it's probably because people are more um, comfortable um, I don't know reporting that they're feeling depressed now compared to you know other types of um, mental illness like um, psychotics um, mental health conditions so yeah so that is depression and um, as I said, like anyone can get depression and then it can last um, a very long time or it can just be an episode. It could be short time or short term or it could be long term, really. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, as you said, like you went through depression. I went through depression as well back in university because I feel like university yeah. <laughs> is like it's a trigger for depression. <laughs> and um, I, I was actually going through a point where I just didn't want to see. I didn't want to see anyone. Didn't want to see my neighbours or my housemates, or sometimes not even going to lectures because I just felt like everything was falling apart, and I just felt safe um, in my own environment, in my room, not really being able to get out or you know to do the basic things. And yeah, so that is depression. My understanding of depression. Good, good, good. So to you, because I think depression is like a, as a person, we all is the term is there, but what might be depression to me might be different from your your experience. You understand? Because I feel like it's a dark hole. It's like some people might be you know just drinking themselves to bed every day. Some might be just binge eating. Some might be just avoiding people. So, to you personally, Kathy, because like, what is depression? You know, you know, you work in the mental health field, and you you probably cancel a lot of people um, personally. What do you think depression is? You know, is it healthy? What's the unhealthy side of it? Okay. <laughs> All right, this 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 is a big one because um, I mean, let me let me jump back to that bipolar question that we had before. Um, I think we fall into this trap as society. We we tend to when we see someone who has mood changes like everyone has mood changes and when someone has mood changes we say oh you're so bipolar i mean that that's not i i i don't agree with that you know it's um we're, because we're trying to take in we're, we're taking something that someone is going through that is very very serious and we're just applying it in general life it's very harmful to them um, so that's one thing and so from there we we say with depression as well we'll be like uh, we can sometimes say oh that she's she's so depressed yeah. you know everybody goes through highs and lows in life life is a roller coaster it goes up and it goes down and you know we we go through low points and most of the times there's like stress is a big trigger of of how we feel um, they say um, I, I talked to one of my colleagues at work and they said that um, the three biggest stresses in life are um, getting married, buying a house, and having a kid. Oh, okay, right. Well, so, uh, so, first one. So, like, I went through the first one, right? Uh, get, getting married. That was last year for me, and so that was a tough time because we had to. I had to kind of manage expectations. I had to, you know, bring out the finances and so on because the stress was so high. There were times when I was like, I don't want to do this. I want to give up and I want to stop. You know, and it doesn't mean I'm clinically depressed. I went through a very, very low point in my life where I didn't want to. There was like a whole weekend where I stayed in bed, didn't do anything, just stayed in bed. And so, um, yeah, it gets to you. Um, so, you know, again, using that word, you know, you're depressed or this person is depressed. It's a very, I feel like it's not taking the situation or taking what others go through seriously. Um, and for me, I think 
depressed has stages you know you could be low um and then you could you could be going to a point where your your daily life for weeks and for months on end is getting affected routinely getting affected um and you feel like you cannot do what you feel like you should be doing and so it's it's putting you it, it spirals again so you feel like ah, oh, i'm not doing what i should be doing i feel terrible and so therefore you have low motivation to do what you're meant to do and then the next day you're like i, I don't have the motivation to do it so i'm not doing what i'm meant to do and it makes you feel like bad again so it just steps down continuously until you break out of it and some people are able to break out of it some people can't and i believe that it's everyone is one bad day away it's just one bad day away or a week, a, a bad week away, a bad month away from having something that could affect us. Uh, you know, if we break our leg, we, we heal it, we, we put a cast on it and we put protection around it so we can heal it. But when a person's mind's broken, why is it that we, are so, we struggle so hard to fix it? Uh, or we struggle so hard to put protective barriers around it and kind of work with it it's it's something that i'm still struggling with and i'm still grappling with in my community and uh in not in my workplace my workplace is more uh, understanding and aware of it because i work in the field but my community so much so and my church community it's it's quite hard to get get to that point yeah i know i, I went away but <laughs> The cultural, the cultural thing is also very important. The religious side of things is very important because some people might experience like a, like a religious encounter, like they're very spiritual. So they might see things or have dreams or revelations or visions, and they might report it to somebody that is non-religious. And could that be seen like you know you've got? I don't think you're okay. Like do you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes I might say I've had a dream about something really absurd, yeah, to human nature, but it might not really be like I'm not well. Yeah. But because of where you're coming from, the culture, um, do you th you th do you feel like sometimes the cultural differences and religious differences can also have an impact on your mental health, Bella? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think we were just talking about earlier, actually, before recording, that because um, we all come, like London, for example, it's a very diverse city like we have people from different cultures like different backgrounds and practicing different traditions um so like it's very easy for like your thoughts or your feelings to be misinterpreted you know and then what i was saying early like earlier it's like it's really important that um we have more um people like from ethnic minorities like in research and in the mental health field because um we need to contribute to the research you know like we need to be yeah. like for like for the majority um ethnic to understand us we need to be part of their research you know what i mean yeah because like what might be interpreted um what might be interpreted um as an illness yeah to one person it might be different to me so you might be telling me a dream and then um, as a non-religious person I'll be like well it sounds like you're hallucinating you know like yeah you're seeing things you know and but to someone else who's religious who's from your same you know practice the same religion or the same um, um, tradition as you culture as you they'll easily understand that okay so this could be this this could be that yeah yes so leading on to that hearing voices is something hallucination you touched on um it's something that we hear about as well when it comes to paranoid schizophrenia you know people see things it might be different from one patient to the other i mean because you guys are very skilled and you're a manager you're project managing in fact and you also your research and you have a psychological degree right am i correct so in your field you know, it's like psychosis or that paranoid schizophrenia diagnosis. Is it a common diagnosis that, you know, you get in yeah. your experience? Yeah, yeah. I'll say um, about 80% of our service users um, have psychosis conditions, psychotic conditions. Um, so it is common. Um, I think that's probably the reason why they're using our services, because if they were just you know they had just you know depression or anxiety that would have been um, dealt by the GP but because it gets to that point you know that's why they come into you know specialist or you know uh, into a, a special service to get that help to get the support that they need so it's very common and and I think what really helps is um, again having a diverse team to 
help the service users and also getting trained like really having skilled staff because that really helps and also to just be prepared like we were talking about earlier like being mentally prepared when you're coming to work because any signs can come up like any incidents can, you need to be prepared for anything really so um i don't really want to like go you know yeah, go on that's, about yeah that's perfect i mean because i mean we worked a few yeah. years ago for yeah. leading mental health charity called richmond fellowship so literally 90 percent of our customers had that label yeah. And they did not really agree with it. They felt like, no, I don't think I've got paranoid or schizoaffective disorder yeah. because that's quite a big yes, diagnosis. Yeah. And the stigma yeah. attached to it is quite huge as well. Like, yeah, is, yeah. Any, anything to add to that, like psychosis um, um, stigma? Uh, I think psychosis is so debilitating is because, well, let, let's let's backtrack a bit. What What is psychosis? So psychosis is um, hearing, feeling, um, seeing, any, any kind of thing that is not weak others cannot see as a hallucination now it becomes debilitating because some of these things that are said some of these things that are seen um are f are not helpful are detrimental so um some some things that are said are like you know you're worthless you know you're not meant to be here you, you should kill yourself and now these voices are present for these people who in in a tangible way they can hear them right now when it becomes um, these are assertive voices which tell people to do certain things like, you know, hit someone or jump off. When someone lets them come in, those voices, and acts on those voices, or those voices are having a huge impact on their life, then it becomes debilitating for their life. Then it becomes something that they cannot live with. And that's why they come to specialist services. That's, that's why they use the services because, you know, they, they can't handle it themselves. And I, m most of my studies, um, most of my research has, ha has been in the field of psychosis. And it's something that I'm interested in because for me, I grapple with it. I grapple with the, with the religious aspect of it, with, with the Christian Christianity and with, with the, the naturalistic view of it. it it's, it's something I struggle with. doesn't mean I'm not a Christian does not mean I'm not religious but uh, I understand that I struggle with certain questions in life and I don't understand it and I might not be able to un understand it or answer it but doesn't doesn't take away from the struggle that I have um, that's my struggle and that's my grappling um, with in terms of psychosis and how to help is that we have to understand that some people have a different struggle some people have a different point where they are struggling with something else in life. You know, we, everybody struggles or most people struggle with financial difficulties. Most people struggle with, you know, stress. Most people struggle with, you know, down, down times. But some others struggle with, um, you know, voices and some, some others struggle with seeing things. It's just, a, it's a different struggle. And we just need to realize that. And so, we don't say, oh no, they're hearing voices, do you know they're, they're, they're acting a little crazy. Yeah. That's another word I don't like, yeah. you know? It, saying that and then kind of ostracizing them or putting them away, it's yeah. not going to help them. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we do because anything away from the normal, we're like, oh, no, that's not normal, I don't want that. Yeah. But, you know, it's, that's not how it should be. Spot on. Um, yeah, we, we're nearly there. I mean, just to summarise uh, for today, um, do you guys think mental health is preventative? And if not, are there anything, any are there causes of it? You know, are this, I know some people, you know, it's, it's just in their bloodline, it's just genetics. So I know there are some that I mean, it's, it's, you know, drug induced. I mean, it's quite a different chapter altogether. But just to briefly summarise, is mental health, is it is it um, preventative or is it the society that puts pressure on people to fall into that dark net? Am I clear? Yeah. yeah. Um, As you said, um, some conditions could be genetic, but you can protect your mental well-being you know so you can prevent some mental health you know so um it's just by knowing that life is hard we do go through you know some highs and lows and then just preparing yourself like uh, i think it's about coping basically managing um anything life throws at you that's the main thing i think um especially with um 
as we were talking about like common um, mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, uh, I'm talking about the generalised ones, obviously not the clinically um, um, diagnosed ones, but with those ones, you can prevent it. You know, I think you can prevent it by protecting your mental well-being, by just practising the little things like, you know, um, like being mindful. That's like the big word everyone's using. Like, yeah, exactly. Mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mindfulness, exactly. It's just like, you know, just being aware of like just living in the moment, really. Um, I don't know, like it's just the simple things like being out there and uh, admiring the outside and um, taking a walk, um, I don't know, volunteering, you know, helping others, um, talking to others. Yeah, just like the little things uh, we think don't really have an impact, but they do like exercising. You know, it doesn't have to be, you, have, you don't have to go to the gym every day, but you know, just like walk, um, run, jog, just like the small things, I, that's how you can look after your mental well-being and also even if you do have a um, mental health condition like you have a diagnosis I think um, there are ways that you can manage them there are ways that you can manage them and and then I think the cycle is there so like I, I'm very sure and I think it is preventable and it is manageable as well if you do have it Thank yeah. you, Bella. Any, anything to add to summarize for today is it is it preventative illness or is it something that you cannot you know deal with um i've oh, i could i could go on for this one uh yeah. <laughs> how, how brief you mean another half an hour yeah we're good with that okay cool <laughs> i mean okay i i don't know whether it's preventative and i don't know whether it's genetic um you know um but there are a few things that i have done but uh, again what works for me may not work for you may not work for you it, it may not work for the others but we we take in life what works for us we adapt it what doesn't work for us we leave it and so you may hear something from me you may hear something from somewhere else you may read something and just take the good what works for you take the good and leave the rest i'm like strategies for me surround yourself with good people surround yourself with people who who un, who understand what you're going through but who don't beat you for it who don't say you know uh, why are you why are you the only one who's going through this you know all of us are here why is it only you have to go through it that's that's the kind of stuff you don't need you know someone who sits with you and go all right what can we do to help what should we do how can we take this forward so that you know you are part of us you are you are one of us and we're gonna go with you on this journey and then another one would be start start your day or have your day with a positive mindset like i went through a dark time and when i went through that difficult time in my place in, in my life i i realized something helped me I, I would listen to positivity in the morning positivity for me was a sermon i would listen to you know what can god do for me and so i would listen to that in the morning and it would drive me it'd be like all right cool uh, I have someone else who can handle me. Positivity for you could be something else. It could be exercise. It could be uh, listen to a podcast with someone who's going through the same thing with you and who's giving you the advice on how to handle it. You know, that's that's your positivity. But start your day with it and it puts your day in a different frame set to go through. And there's so many other psychological practices like um, writing a gratitude letter, writing three things your gratitude for every day put it away and then in the morning you can you can look at it and be like oh right I was gratitude for this for last what about what about today and you start your day looking for things that you will be gratitude you will have gratitude for yeah. um, and but there are so many things on the internet that you can look for and be like these are good practices you know it might not work for you if, if you try it and it doesn't work for you all right cool try a different one something something that works for you you find it and you stick to it and put it into a routine you know you do one thing if you go to the gym once a week you're never gonna see change in your life why is it that why is it that we do one good practice in in <laughs> why is it that we do one good <laughs> I, I I made a 2018 I made a decision that I'm going to stop paying for my gym membership because I paid for it for a whole year without going so yeah that was terrible it was painful so I mean why why is it that we think that we can do one good thing a month and then help and hope that would affect our mental health 
well-being for that whole month. It doesn't work that way, you know. It, get it into a routine. Start doing things that get you to feel good throughout the day and motivate you throughout the week. And set it into a routine because a routine is hard to break, you know. I've been trying to break my habit of biting nails for years now. Still not leaving me. <laughs> it's still not leaving me. So, yeah, that's, that's one thing. So surround yourself with good people. Find things that will work for you. And then set it into a routine so you're constantly going back into it. And yeah. that worked for me. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. For everyone. Just one more. Uh -huh. Should we ask uh, for everyone? Well. Oh, brief, brief. I know. <laughs> <laughs> one more advice for young people out there. Uh, social media. Because that is affecting a lot of young people. Um, it's putting them through, I don't know, a lot. Like depressive mode. And, and just feeling feeling like they're worthless or they're not achieving enough you know just because they're comparing themselves to others so what you should really do you should have a social media detox right so if you feel like you know you get to a point where you're comparing yourself to a lot of people yeah it's time to switch it off and then just give yourself like a week and you know just get off it you know and just focus on yourself because the only thing you, the only person you should be competing with is yourself really set personal goals and then focus on that and then no one else because you don't know what people are doing behind closed doors you don't know how they're getting to where they are like a lot of people they're successful but they had to go through a lot of challenges to get there you might not see the challenges you only see in the, you know the success you only see yourself exactly the yeah exactly yeah so <laughs> <laughs> with filter. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to end here. We can go on and on. I think we need to do another episode oh, yeah. on this. Um, thank you so much for coming through. Um, it's been an honour to have you all. Um, yeah, I've learned so much today. Um, guys, I hope you tune in, you like and subscribe to our channel. Until then, guys, bye. See ya.